Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the another session of the network seminar series hosted centered for networked intelligence at the ECE and RBC CPS IASC. Today's talk is by Dr. Neeraj Kayal, and he will be speaking on applications of algebraic complexity to unsupervised learning. Dr. Kayal has is a currently a principal researcher at the Microsoft Research Lab in Bengaluru. He works in the areas of complexity theory, algorithms, and related areas of theoretical computer science. He received his B.Tech and Ph.D. from IIT Kanpur and has held postdoctoral positions for advanced study Princeton and at Rutgers University. Together with Manindra Agarwal and Nitin Saxena, he was a part of the team that discovered for the first time deterministic polynomial time algorithm for primality testing. This work received the Godel Prize and the Fulkerson Prize in 2006. His recent work has been focused on algorithms and lower bounds in algor algebraic complexity theory for which he and his co-authors received some best paper awards at various conferences. For this body of work, he also received the Infosys Prize in 2021 and Bhatnakar Award in 2022. Most recently, he has been working on unsupervised learning. Before we move on to the talk, we would like the audience to subscribe to our Google group for information on future talks through the link in the chat box. Please visit the website for more details. We kindly request the online audience to keep their microphones on silent and unmute them or drop the questions on the chat box only when clarifications are needed. Over to you, Dr. Kaya. Thank you for coming on this rainy evening. So uh, I want to talk about unsupervised learning and the like some algorithms that we discovered which use um, notions from algebraic complexity. Uh, I realize this audience has uh, uh, like maybe very little complexity background. So please stop uh, stop me and feel free to ask questions. If anything is unclear or if I'm going too fast. So let me go to the applications first. Uh, in this area called unsupervised learning, what in unsupervised learning in general, what we want to do is we are given some data which has some structure and we want to understand uh, what that underlying structure is. So let me give some examples. And most of these examples will involve data, which consists of a set of points in n-dimensional space. So our first example is uh, this. Uh, let me do it by picture. Uh, a collection of points like this in the plane in two dimensions. And can you see some structure to this data? Um, any guesses? Yeah, yeah. So, so you guessed it essentially. 
there are three lines and all the points are close to one of these three lines, right? And here the problem in general would be given a bunch of points in n dimensions uh, such that there are a few subspaces and all the points are close to one of the these unknown subspaces. We want to find these unknown subspaces. And we want a fast algorithm for doing this. Right? Um, any questions about this application? Before I... So uh, from the application, we'll know that some such structure like this is there. So let me give another example of mixtures of Gaussians. So here's another set of points in the plane. And this has some structure. Maybe you can try to guess. Um, yeah, there are essentially two ellipses like this. Or um, which essentially describe these points, or more precisely, uh, there are two Gaussian distributions in the plane. Uh, both of these Gaussian distributions have uh, the origin at the center. They overlap, and let's say you pick roughly half the points from the red distribution and half the points from the green distribution. Uh, Again, this occurs in many applications. You can imagine, for example, you could collect uh, the heights and weights of all people in, let's say, India. And if you look at a pair, like a height and weight of a person over a population, uh, this is like a Gaussian distribution. But maybe this population has two groups. Let's say maybe males and females. And males have their own Gaussian distribution. The averages and the standard deviations are slightly different from that for females. So, uh, so in general, you are given a bunch of points in n dimensions. They are sampled from a mixture of, let's say, uh, a small number of Gaussians, let's say 100 Gaussians you want to find out each of those Gaussian components, uh, the means and the what are called the standard deviations or the correlations matrices of all these Gaussian matrices. Um, let me give one more example. This is close to the signal processing uh, thing. Now, in this example, we have uh, like seven uh, sources of sound, a car, a TV, a person, an orchestra, and so on. And uh, the sound made by each of these sources are received by, let's say, seven microphones, which are there. So each of these microphones receives a combination of the sounds made by these. What we are given is at every uh, time, uh, step or at every instant of time, the amplitude of the signal received at each of these microphones. And we want to separate out the sources, like we want to understand uh, what uh, is the sound made by each of those sources individually. Right? So, uh, so here, let me formulate it mathematically like this. Um, we think of the sound emitted by a source as a random vector, y, a seven, a seven dimensional random vector. And what we are given are measurements of x, which is uh, the measurements that we have x, there are some linear combinations of uh, y's and each of those y's are independent sources. This is a critical thing. Uh, um, they are independent sources of sound. Right? So under this assumption that 
the yi's are independent random variables we want to be able to find this uh, mixing matrix a the way that you are combining these independent sources um, to get the signals so uh, this is one problem so what i will do is uh, i will give a general sort of solution template for problems of this nature uh let me give one more problem uh which has more of a computer science flavor let me mention this nevertheless so more generally the thing is this what we want to do in unsupervised learning is we have uh, typically data points drawn from a distribution from an unknown distribution and we uh, we are given a sample or, or a set of data points like this and we want to sort of understand what the underlying distribution is and uh, here's one more example of that so uh, again think of m independent sources think of m as small let's say 10 uh, let's say each of these yi's y1 through ym they are independent gaussian random variables what we don't get to observe the y's at all what we get to observe are points in n dimensional space so the outputs uh, uh, there are n outputs and think of n as say 100 and each of those outputs is a polynomial function of the inputs so this is a generalization of the previous thing where the x size where where n was equal to m and the X size were linear combinations of the inputs. Now we more generally allow polynomial combination of the inputs. Then uh, again, I emphasize this: we are given only the output samples, not the inputs. And given uh, like here's how the distribution is generated: you sample the y's. Uh, compute these n polynomials of these y's you will get a for every such uh, 10 dimensional point you will get a 100 dimensional point and you give me only the 100 dimensional points a bunch of them and I want to understand what these polynomials are the hidden transformation so for in particular let's say each of the outputs is a quadratic polynomial and the yi's are independent gaussian random variables we want to recover the polynomials uh, so the, the techniques that i will mention will not be will not only be applicable to data which is sets of points but also uh, to things like textual data so for ex uh, here's an example uh, you we have pieces of text so so think of like uh, small snippets of text uh, like eight with eight words in it and things like uh, like maybe these four snippets of text uh, there's some sort of structure to it I mean, uh, well, there are there's very few examples, so it will let me just tell you what the structure here is. Like, essentially, there are two groups here. Like, the first and the third snippets are talking about uh, medicine, and the second and fourth is talking about cricket. So, more generally, uh, given the uh, snippets of text like this each snippet corresponds to a topic we want to understand or we want to cluster these snippets into different topics so here the green ones will cluster into one topic cricket uh, sorry the green ones are about medicine and um, 
and the blue ones are about cricket. And we want to do it automatically, like without being uh, told what these topics are. And so it turns out that many such problems, uh, there's some sort of common solution template to try to solve this. So uh, how do uh, I, I, how can I even begin to uh, solve problems like this? Here's what I can try to do. Let, so let's come back to the setting where the data that I have is a set of points in RN. So uh, here's what I would do. I can use the data to compute various averages. So I could look at uh, the average of the first coordinates uh, or the average of the second coordinates or the average of the product of the first and second coordinates. So let me just uh, mention this here. So I have uh, date, there's a distribution D over points in Rn and I can look at the expected value of, say, if I'm given a point x equal to x1, x2, xn, sampled from this, I could look at, let's say, the expectation of the first coordinate. Or uh, I could look at the expectation of the product of the first and the second coordinates and so on. Now, uh, here's a fact that, so I could do this over the entire distribution or I could do it only over a sample that I'm given. So I could choose X from this set uniformly at random and I could look at uh, the average of let's say the product of the first and second coordinates over points from this sample only. Right? And here's a basic statistical fact that I'm sure you would know is that uh, the, uh, the true averages the, or the true expectations are close to the empirical expectations from the sample. So, uh, so given samples like uh, I can compute these quantities. Now, uh, these depending on what the structure of the distribution is, these moments are functions of the structural parameters. So, so let me ex uh, take examples here. So take this example of uh, mixture of subspaces or uh, cluster of subspaces. Uh, depending on what these subspaces are, these subspaces will determine the, uh, the expected values. The, these are called the moments of the distribution. Similarly here, for mixtures of Gaussians, again, the means and the covariance matrices of these Gaussians will determine the moments of the distribution uh, and so on, right? In each of these cases, one can sort of define uh, the moments like this. And from the sample, we have the empirical moments, these are the empirical moments and these will be, this is what I can calculate easily from the data. And these are close to the true moments, which uh, and sort of the true moments are functions of the parameters of the distribution. And these parameters are what I am trying to learn. The Like in the case of subspaces, the parameters would be, uh, let's say, 
the numbers or the weights which define the subspace. Right? Uh, so, so the general idea here is from these moments, I want to recover the parameters. And uh, so in each of these cases, it's you can think about it. It's not too difficult to write down these the true moments as polynomial functions of the parameters. So in each of these examples that I mentioned, these you can explicitly write down what the true moments are as as a function of the parameters. So now uh, the we come to the algorithmic question. How can I re efficiently recover using a fast algorithm um, the, um, the the parameters from the empirical moments that I have here? Any uh, any questions about the problem setup? Yes. So, so we, so for example, in subspace clustering, we are assuming that the points are generated in in a subspace clustered way. That there are these small number of subspaces. Yeah, we have to make that assumption. So, depending on what we are trying to learn. And uh, so there are different ways to do it. People um, like this idea has been used in mach machine learning, unsupervised learning before. Uh, so, but here's where we depart from that. Um, so here's our idea. We take these moments and put them as the coefficients of a formal polynomial. So here is what I would do. For example, I could do the following. Now I will introduce n formal variables. Okay. Um, and I form a polynomial of these formal variables like this. So in order to define a the polynomial I have to tell you what the coefficient of each monomial is. So it will be a polynomial of let's say degree uh, d. Let me just go up to degree 2 for example. So here's what I would do. For uh, for the monomial z1, I will uh, put in the expectation of x1 when x is chosen from the distribution d and so on. The coefficient of z2 is the expectation of the second coordinate, the second. The coefficient of z1, z2 is the expectation of the product of the first two coordinates and so on. Okay. So, uh, uh, in fact, this is sort of the true moment polynomial. What I have is empirical data. So I would form a polynomial where, um, uh, let me call it F tilde, the empirical moment polynomial, uh, where instead of the true moments, I put in the sample moments. Now, so far, all that I've done is this is just a bookkeeping device for the moments. Um, I've just taken a bunch of numbers, put them as coefficients of a polynomial. Nothing sort of seem, uh, nothing interesting seems to have happened uh, so far. But here's the remarkable thing. In each of those applications that I mentioned, this polynomial turns out to have a small formula. And I will explain what I mean by that. And this is really remarkable. Like, um, I'll explain this uh, in more detail. Um, 
that this happens to be true in, in so many different situations. And so this is where algebraic complexity comes in. Algebraic complexity asks this question, given a polynomial, which uh, how do I find the smallest formula for it? So that is the next part of the talk. Um, and uh, just to round out the application, uh, what we'll do is using techniques from algebraic complexity, we'll find this formula for this empirical moment polynomial. And that will essentially tell us all the parameters of the distribution in each of those applications. So this is roughly the end of the first part of my talk. I just wanted to make this connection between understanding uh, structure of a data given as a set of points and polynomials. via this fact that uh, when you form this polynomial like this, it often tends to have a small formula. Yeah. Uh, no, so this polynomial I from the data S, which is a collection of points, finite set of points, I can write down the polynomial. Now, uh, yeah. I will explain in a moment what, what I mean by a small formula. So I have to find the small formula for this polynomial. This is what I want to do. Is that? Yeah. So it will turn out in each of these applications, the parameters of the distribution uh, come up as coefficients in the small formula. You, you can, if you find a small formula for this thing, you can just read out the, from the formula, you can read out the parameters. And I will give an example of that also in a moment. So, uh, so yeah, there's a small thing. These, uh, we only know the true moments approximately because the sample moments are not exactly the true moments, but uh, I'll ignore that for now. So now let me uh, tell you about formulas or expressions for polynomials, what I mean by that. Uh, let's take a polynomial in five variables like this. It can have a long expression as a sum of monomials, but uh, sometimes it happens that it has a much shorter expression. So in this case, this polynomial is equal to this expression here. And it's in some sense, this is shorter than the original thing. You can, uh, in fact, if you have a polynomial in variables of degree, let's say n, the number of monomials can be exponential, but uh, it, you can have formulas which are very small, like linear. Um, in, in the number of variables. So an example of such a formula would be, uh, you take, let's say, Fz, which is, let's say, Z1 plus Z2 plus Zn to the n. If you expand it out as a sum of monomials, it will have about, uh, yeah, exponentially many, uh, monomials, but this is a sort of a very small formula for this polynomial. Uh, so another way of thinking of a formula uh, with, as a tree, like we mathematicians just uh, think of them as expressions like this. Computer scientists like to think of them as trees. It's the same thing exactly. You just have arranged how you build up the uh, formula or, or the expression in, in terms of a tree with um, like this. Like, I, let me not formally define it. You can um, quickly see the correspondence between uh, these two rep ways of thinking of a formula. 
this a natural correspondence. The only thing I will remark here is that in a, like this tree will have nodes labeled by addition and multiplication um, and will allow the incoming edges to an addition node to contain these constants. So what this means is that this node here is computing x2 minus x3. This is computing x1 plus x3. This is computing x1 plus x3 times x2 minus x3 and so on and um, right and that's how that expression here corresponds to this tree here it's, it's a very natural correspondence so in algebraic complexity this is a basic question that we ask we are interested in uh, answering you are given a polynomial and we want to know how many operations or how many additions, multiplications, subtractions are required to compute this polynomial or what's the smallest formula for this polynomial essentially, right? It seems like a uh, natural question. Let me give you some more motivation for it. And now in some parts of this talk, I'll cheat a little bit. Uh, so my statements will not be technically precisely correct, but morally correct only. So, but uh, let me give this example of a Hamiltonian cycle. So, uh, this is a like a classic computer science problem. Uh, we are given a graph with n vertices and we want to find out if this graph has a Hamiltonian cycle, a, a cycle which goes through every vertex in the graph exactly once. So here's an example. So, uh, so there's this classic question in computer science. Do can we have an efficient algorithm to determine whether a given graph has a Hamiltonian cycle or not? And if it has, can we find these cycles efficiently? So, uh, So it turns out that you can restate this problem essentially in terms of a polynomial. We call it the Hamiltonian problem, uh, polynomial. Here's what you do. You consider, let's say, the complete graph on n vertices and think of every edge between a vertex i and a vertex j. It's labeled by a formal variable xij. And I go over all possible Hamiltonian cycles in this complete graph and take the product of the variables on the edges of this cycle. So the details are not very important, but the point here is this, this polynomial, it's very easy to verify, but this polynomial has this property that if you are, if these xij's are zeros or ones, zero, so meaning that when these xij's, they correspond to whether an edge is present or not in a given graph. So when you're give, given an actual graph, uh, all these xij's are either 0 or 1. Uh, then if you plug in zeros and 1's into this polynomial, then the value of this polynomial is precisely the number of Hamiltonian cycles in that uh, graph. So, so this uh, P versus NP problem, you can sort of, not exactly, but I'm cheating a, uh, quite significantly here, but you can roughly ask this question, does this Hamiltonian polynomial uh, have a small formula or not? That's roughly a restatement of uh, the P versus NP question with, with some big caveats, but. Uh, so it turns out, so why we find this problem interesting is that is because if you, for this single polynomial, if you can compute it efficiently, or th that means if it has a small formula, then for all, and take it with a pinch of salt, for almost all combinatorial problems, you can uh, find the number of solutions or like 
here you could ask this question in a given graph how many hamiltonian cycles are there or not how many hamiltonian cycles are there or you could ask um, in, in a um, given um, bipartite graph how many matchings are there or um, lots of other combinatorial problems like this or a given a, a bunch of equations polynomial equations how many solutions are there over a finite field so it turns out that many if this polynomial had a small formula for a, almost all such problems you you would be able to find the number of solutions efficiently and this was discovered in the 70s and this is sort of uh, why uh, problems like p versus np became sort of the central problems in computer science so uh, does uh, and the conjecture which has been open for more than 50 years now is that no this particular polynomial does not have a small formula but it's been 50 years and uh, we still don't know the answer so uh, along with my uh, co-authors we made some progress on this uh, i will just summarize this uh, i won't describe everything in the uh, or the technical details but I just want to give you a flavor of the kind of results uh, that we had obtained. So, uh, in 2014, we showed that the Hamiltonian, actually a slightly different polynomial, but morally equivalent, um, it does not have small regular formulas. And small here is polynomial size, and regular here is that the underlying tree is sort of a balanced tree. Uh, let me not formally define it, but some like a natural balanced tree kind of structure, if you uh, have, then such a formula uh, of small size cannot compute the Hamiltonian. So under some restrictions, under some natural restrictions, we could show this. And uh, recently, two years ago, uh, Nutan Limaye, Srikanth Srinivasan, and Sebastian Tavenas, um, they showed this remark, they had a remarkable result. It really improved our result in some different ways. Uh, but it's uh, a big breakthrough in this area. They showed that the Hamiltonian polynomial, again, I'm cheating slightly here. It does not have small formulas if you restrict the depth of the formula. So, so, so you allow formulas essentially correspond to trees. And how many layers are there in this tree is called the depth. So, if you make the number of layers, let's say 10, you can show a lower bound on. Uh, the size of the formula required to compute the Hamiltonian. Uh, the number of nodes in the tree. Uh, the total number, yes. Uh, yeah, and another way to think of it is just, if you write it down as a mathematical expression, how long will that expression be? The, those are equivalent. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, a big breakthrough, breakthrough in this area. So, uh, so this concludes the second part of my talk, which is I wanted to just give you a flavor of algebraic complexity, what questions we ask, and what is sort of what we know. Uh, the big open problem, whether Hamiltonian has small formula, that remains open to this day. Uh, let me just remark here, you see, the difficulty here is 
when I want to tell you that something has a small formula or this problem has an efficient algorithm, I can just come to you and give you the formula or the algorithm, right? When I want a, a conjecture like this is saying that uh, there is no fast algorithm or no small formula. So when you want to prove a result like this, you have to sort of reason over all possible algorithms or all possible formulas and, and that's a huge number of them. And it's, it's sort of like trying to prove an impossibility result over all possible algorithms uh, and that's sort of way difficult to do in general. Oh, yeah. So this result uh, restricts the depth. It says if you fix the depth to be 10 and every node, like every multiplication or addition gate, you can have arbitrary fan in. Um, and the depth is, let's say, fixed to 10. Then the size of the formula has to be very large. But potentially, it could be that you could have depth, uh, let's say, n corresponding to the number of inputs or number of variables. And with unrestricted depth, we don't know such a result. Does, does that answer your question? Oh, so yeah, I didn't make this small precise. Uh, small is poly, poly n size. So if the depth is n, that's still polynomial. Uh, okay, here's one fact. Uh, what we know is that if you pick a random polynomial of, let's say, degree n in n variables, a random one, then with extremely, extremely high probability, like extremely close to one, exponentially close to one, uh, this such a random polynomial will require uh, a formula of exponential size, uh, like essentially 2 to the n, more than 2 to the n in this case. Um, uh, n to the n in this case. Uh, no, sorry, two, 2 to the n. Um, so, okay, random polynomials require formulas of x, like size 2 to the n. And uh, as, like we don't know a single explicit polynomial uh, which requires like slightly uh, big formulas like slightly big here is or super polynomial like let's say n to the log n or let's say even more than n to the six we don't know uh, so it, it might seem a bit paradoxical we know that most form polynomials uh, require extremely large formulas, but we don't know a single thing, single explicit thing, which uh, we can provably say that it requires large formulas. And again, the difficulty here is to be able to reason about all possible formulas. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so I'll come to that exactly. That's my next thing. So uh, I'll describe that structure. And, uh, and uh, it turns out sort of the structure or the proof that we use uh, to prove such lower bound results, the proof techniques can be used to design algorithms to learn formulas. And, and that's how uh, then you get algorithms for those other problems that I mentioned in the beginning. So uh, okay, okay, so let me just 
first mention this connection and I will come back to your question. So it turns out that most of these lower bound proofs uh, can be used to uh, find the formulas for a polynomial if, if the formula if a small formula exists under certain non-degeneracy conditions. Uh, and more recently, what we showed was the following that even if you are given the polynomial, not exactly, but approximately. And so this, this approximation is important because in these applications, these like we have data chosen from some underlying distribution. We are given a finite set of samples. So the sample moments, which are the coefficients of the polynomial, are not exactly equal to the true moments. They're, they're only approximately equal to the true moments. So when we so, so that means that given a finite sample, we know this moment polynomial only approximately. Or th this polynomial that I have is an approximation to the true moment polynomial. And the true moment polynomial is what has a small formula. So, so we can make this algorithm robust in the sense that given uh, the polynomial only approximately, we can also recover the small formula for it. And that essentially as a corollary, we get algorithms for uh, various problems that I mentioned in the beginning. Again, let me make one more remark here. Each of these problems, in the worst case, uh, they are NP hard. So, if you know about compute, like uh, th these things in computer science, basically, you can't hope to solve any of these problems for worst case instances, worst case inputs. So, these are algorithms which will work for most inputs, but not all inputs. So, yeah. Yes. So, okay. Uh, uh, here, what I was trying to point out is that uh, uh, I ha like from the sample, I can sort of write down this polynomial, which is approximately or it is close to or, or it's an approximation to the true moment polynomial where the true moment polynomial is where I sample from the distribution or think of it as infinite number of samples. And in all these applications, the thing that happens is that the true moment polynomial has a small formula. So, uh, if I can learn formulas, I, I can find, uh, oh yeah, and one more thing, when, when I, once I learn the formula, the parameters of the distribution will just, uh, I can read out from the formula. So, let me take a concrete example and maybe it will become clearer. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. No. So, uh, this talk is mostly you should think of polynomials with real coefficients. And in the beginning, I talked about uh, problems where you are given a set of points in real n-dimensional space in uh, and this set of points has some structure and we want to find that underlying structure uh, yeah so, uh, so so in the beginning i'd mentioned this problem of learning mixtures of gaussians where you are given a set of points which are sampled from a distribution which is a mixture of gaussians so it turns out that 
if you look at a mixture of Gaussians, then the true moment polynomial is a sum of powers of quadratic polynomials. Uh, and the number of summands is the number of components in the mixture. Uh, this is a like a remarkable fact in itself, but just believe me for now. So then uh, for learning mixtures of Gaussians, here's what I want to do. I have this approximate moment polynomial. I want to write it as a sum of powers of quadratic polynomials. Uh, sum of power of R quadratic polynomials, R is the number of components in the mixture. And um, yeah, each of these summands is a, like if I'm looking at a degree D moment polynomial, uh, I want the summands to be QI to the D by two, where QI is a degree two polynomial quadratic polynomial. Right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, and we want to do it robustly when there is uh, noise. That means we uh, the polynomial that I have is only approximately equal to the true polynomial, or another way to put it is that. The polynomial that I have is a true moment polynomial plus a perturbation. So now I will come back to your question of uh, connecting up the lower bounds with the learning algorithms. So let me describe what a typical lower bound in uh, this area looks like. So uh, yeah went very slow, sorry. So, uh, so th this last few minutes, maybe I'll go fast, but um, here's what you do. Uh, you come up with a set of linear maps. Now, now we are changing the my viewpoint. I'm thinking of a polynomial as a vector on which linear maps I can apply. And typically you should think of linear maps as thinking uh, things like, partial derivatives. You can take a polynomial and differentiate it with respect to a variable. That's a linear map. You can plug in a value for a variable. That's also a linear map. You can multiply a polynomial with another fixed polynomial uh, and so on, things like this. Okay, so uh, by combining things like this, I will construct a set of linear maps which has two properties. Uh, for every summand SI, when I hit SI with this collection of linear maps, then now uh, SI, it's a polynomial, which I'm thinking of it as a vector. If I hit it with a collection of linear maps, I'll get a collection of points, right? And I want the dimension of the space spanned by this collection of points to be small. So that's what the uh, first, uh, property I want. And for the polynomial F itself, I want the dimension to be large. Uh, and if that happens, then it implies that the number of summands required to write F has to be large. Can you see that? So, uh, so for example, it's another fact that if you take any um, uh, polynomial of even degree, you can write it out as a sum of powers of quadratics, but the number of summands could be very large. So if you could find linear maps <clears throat> uh, for which a power of a quadratic has small uh, image, and let's say my Hamiltonian has a large image, then you would have a lower bound on the number of summands required. So uh, now it uh, now let me just finish by connecting up the lower bounds with the algorithm. Now in the algorithm, what we want to do is given f, which is a sum of simple polynomials like this, we want to learn 
the summands SI. So we will use these linear maps that I use for lower bounds in the following way. So uh, this is an example of the actual set of linear maps that I would use for mixtures of Gaussians. Uh, so here's the idea. You, you are given F, you hit it with this collection of linear maps L, which comes from the lower bounds. Now, typically this, so, and you look at the space spanned by this um, set of polynomials. Uh, and typically it will break up as a sum of subspaces. And then uh, very often you can find another set of linear maps, again, inspired by lower bounds with the following property that, oh, but yeah, you can find another set of linear maps M such that each of these subspaces, uh, L of S1, L of S2 and so on, each of those subspaces are invariant under the action of M. Yeah, M was again partial derivative uh, composed with multiplication by degree one polynomials. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, L was also not exactly partial derivative, but um, with some substitutions. Uh, so, uh, so, so let me, yeah, uh, let me just convey this, uh, uh, give you some sense of what is going on here. Uh, when I hit F. Uh, with this collection of linear maps, the space that I get, uh, the vector space, uh, often turns out to be a like a direct sum of these uh, component vector spaces. And so, uh, so th this other collection of linear maps M helps me find these subspaces, and. The way to think of it is like this, and another way to think of it like is this. You can think of M as a collection of matrices acting on the space U. So what you are trying to do is fi uh, find a basis of this vector space U such that each of these uh, matrices in M becomes simultaneously block diagonal. So, uh, so what I want is to find a proper basis so that let's say each of these matrices, they look like this. Right? And then uh, what this would mean is that um, uh, once you have that basis, then the space corresponding to the sort of these columns will constitute a vector space, which is invariant under the action of M. So it turns out you can do this efficiently. You, you can uh, simultaneously block diagonalize matrices efficiently. We call this vector space decomposition. And uh, yeah, so it's so some sort of generalization of this thing that you would have no doubt done of finding eigenspaces and eigen eigenvectors and eigen values of matrices. So, but now instead of one matrix, you have a collection of matrices and you want to sort of find common eigen, si simultaneously common eigenspaces of all these matrices. And that can be done. And yeah, let me not tell you how to do that. Um, yeah, it, it can be done. So essentially, and once you have that, uh, you would have found the subspaces and once you have the subspaces, again, there's a simple way to find the summands themselves. So, so essentially, uh, when you are given an F, you can find these, uh, the summands S1 through SR and this helps you sort of 
uh, you keep applying this for addition and multiplication gates, uh, sort of go down the tree of additions and multiplications like this, and it helps you recover the formula for a uh, given polynomial. So there was one question here. So like uh, in in these applications, for example, uh, when you when you have a mixture of Gaussians, each of these summands is a power of a quadratic. The coefficients of quadratic of, of each of these quadratics are exactly the entries of the covariance matrices of the components of the uh, Gaussian mixture. So each Gaussian has something called a covariance matrix, which describes how it is oriented in space. And that essentially you can read out from the coefficients of this quadratic. And the same phenomena happens again and again. Like essentially from that formula, you can read out the parameters of the distribution. So, and it turns out that even if you, uh, th this algorithm can be made robust in the sense that even if you know that polynomial only approximately, there's a perturbation here, P, then also you can recover these summands approximately. And yeah, the idea in hindsight is very simple. You, you just replace sort of equality by sort of the right notion of almost equal. But it took us a long time to figure this out. and. Um, I'll skip this. It, um, uh, yeah, so in, in particular, this uh, sort of meta algorithm that I told you how to learn formulas, um, it as a corollary, it solves all these other problems in learning. And we can prove some bounds on uh, when we are given f on approximately the uh, the formula that we recover there's some noise so we don't recover the coefficients exactly we can but we can bound uh, how far away we are these bounds depend on uh, singular word values of certain matrices that come up and only in some cases unfortunately can we prove good bounds on these singular values? So, uh, yeah, in terms of provable guarantees, there's still uh, some um, unknown problems here, or open problems here. And um, in, in particular, uh, we conjecture that, uh, for example, for the mixture of Gaussians, uh, even if you take a worst case instance and then perturb it slightly, the um, the singular values are not too small. The the relevant singular values are not too small. So so that the output that we get is a pretty good uh, approximation to the true parameters. And I find this at least conjecture particularly interesting uh, because um, it turns out that this model of mixtures of Gaussians, it's more than a hundred years old and it has been studied in the statistics community for like more than a century. And if this conjecture was true, in some sense, it would uh, uh, like finally solve this problem of learning mixtures of Gaussians. Um, So I have some more remarks, I'll skip that. And we did some experiments and um, empirically also this algorithm works very well. Like uh, it's much more robust to noise than the earlier algorithm. So uh, in this graph, uh, yeah, the this graph is about the error in the output as you add noise. So the lower is better. And ours is a green algorithm. The 
green line, so it has the smallest error. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and there are lots of open questions in in, in this approach. Uh, in particular, if you can prove uh, bounds on certain singular values, then uh, and we have some evidence for it also. Uh, then it will imply that this uh, 100 year old problem mixtures of Gaussians will finally be solved in some sense. Um, and uh, yeah, in general, we don't know how to uh, recover constant depth formula. There are some uh, there are some technical reasons for that, like we don't know whether some of those conditions hold if uh, we uh, choose a random formula. But let me just end uh, in one minute. So uh, with a couple of philosophical remarks or essentially, which also corresponds to what I'm pursuing currently. So you would no doubt have heard about machine learning where essentially you are given or what usually corresponds to supervised learning where you are given data points together with labels and you want to learn a, a, a small easy to describe function typically a neural network which will be able to map the input to the label right so so for example you are given uh, pictures of cats and dogs. They're given the pictures and the labels. This is a picture of a cat. This is a picture of a dog. So large number of such pictures. And then you want uh, a neural network, uh, equivalently a circuit, which will do the correct labeling. Uh, that's supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we are given only the pictures, no labels. Let's say for data sets, such as images. So by the way, if you have a data set, like if you have an image, let's say a 100 by 100 image, you can think of it as a point in 10,000 dimensional space. So it fits in this framework. And it's real world images are chosen from some distribution. We don't know exactly what the distribution is. So, uh, so given a data set consisting of points from a distribution, can we learn the underlying distribution or not? And here is how uh, I formulate this problem. Uh, here is how the distribution will be generated. You pick a small number of uh, random variables, x1 through xm. So again, for the case of images, think of x1 through xm. Think of m as small, let's say maybe like 20. Um, and Let's say if these are pictures of animals, uh, these X size would describe, let's say, uh, their height, their width, uh, uh, like um, numerical various values for various features, like how long are the legs and so on. And, and then given these things, these numbers, you can imagine that there's a small process which generates an, the image. So, you can imagine if I told you it's a image of an animal, um, and let's say, the, and this y is a categorical random variable. Let's say it describes the kind of animal, like maybe uh, a four-legged animal, a two-legged animal, a bird, and so on. So then you have this categorical random variable, the kind of animal, and for a four-legged animal, let's say. Um, the a bunch of numbers describing various features, there might be a small uh, algorithm to generate the image, the final image. So if we have distributions like this generated by small circuits here, can we learn that distribution? And yeah, like we, we don't know, like um, there's a whole science about learning such uh, distributions that I think is waiting to be discovered. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Kayal, for an information talk. Any more questions? Just try to interpret uh, the way in which the uh, lower bound was shown. Somehow, for that structure, you were able to argue that uh, per SI, you are able to get only this much amount of information about your uh, coefficients, uh, whereas you need to gather that's the dimensionality. The, somehow the dimensionality is a measure of how much information you're able to gather, whereas you need to gather so much. Uh, and that sort of makes the argument that if you want to reach the full information, you need to have a lot more uh, um, uh, uh, a lot more elements in the formula. Is, is that sort of the idea, rough idea? I didn't follow all the details. just call it hmm. complexity rather than information. Hmm. We... Anyway, yeah, but roughly... So there is some com complexity bottleneck per formula, per, per item of the formula. Yes. And you have a large complexity that you'll have to gather. So, exactly. And uh, somehow the structure that enables this, uh, uh, yeah, is the one that you described, was it in your formula or in the one of Limay, Srinivasan and uh, third uh, person? So th they had a different set of linear operators. So now the art of proving lower bounds boiled down to finding the right set of linear operators and uh, proving bounds on if you hit a small formula with this collection of linear operators, what is the dimension of the space that you will get? So we initially discovered some one set of linear operators. They discovered another set of linear operators which worked uh, more generally and gave better results. And, and then later on, we realized that our set of linear operators would also give that same result, uh, but uh, it required a more careful analysis. So now we have like many different sets of linear operators, which will prove such lower bounds. And with respect to the noisy version where you're trying to recover, let's say the polynomial, but uh, P is sort of giving you some error. Um, so uh, there could be several such P's, uh, sorry, there could be several formulae and a different P that sort of, uh, uh, so there is degeneracy there. Yes. And I'm trying to understand what it means by uh, recovery. So in your formula, you're assuming that the true one is this, um, and the P is also somewhat randomly generated. Yes, and so you're giving an upper bound, which is uh, yeah. based on the uh, on the p. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So uh, you can think of it like this: uh, if you think of polynomials themselves as vectors, uh, the they're vectors in this huge uh, exponentially large dimensional space. But uh, the way to think of it is like this. The the ones the polynomials which have small formulas, they are a very small low dimensional manifold inside this very big space. Hmm. Now, uh, this low dimensional manifold is the structure that is coming from uh, squares, uh, the the, the yeah. Gaussian structure. Exactly. Okay, yeah. so if you take a power of a quadratic, hmm. uh, let's say. A, nth power of a quadratic. Hmm. This is a polynomial of degree 2n. So it lies in a space of dimension 2 to the n. But uh, in, in some sense, a quadratic has only n squared degrees of freedom. So it's a power of a quadratic is a sort of a manifold of dimension roughly n square in a 2 to the n dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of the true f. What we are given is a perturbation of this f plus p. Uh, right. So, given this, we cannot hope to recover the original f exactly. What we can hope to recover is a formula which is like sort of close to this. So, there will always be an error and um, we go back to the manifold, but we don't, we can't go back exactly to the point on the manifold where we started off with. We'll find some nearby point. And, uh, and then the question is, how far away would we be from the original less? Hmm. The, uh, so these seem like absolute bounds in the sense that in terms of the P error, in, in terms of the P and its weight, you're able to get it. But you haven't turned them into probabilistic bounds. Um, 
uh, is there is it a straightforward uh, mapping because these come from random data distributions uh, which are gaussian and so on so yeah. you've not turned them into probabilistic models i'm just curious why yeah no so okay in our results we the results that we have are for p which is worst case is that but in practice this perturbation is is uh, not worst case this is this perturbation is comp- coming because of the uh, sample mean differing from the true mean so it's kind of random and in practice our algorithm performs far better in the sense that the error in the output that we get in practice is far less than the theoretical bounds that we have So you said if you can find one set of linear map that satisfies those two conditions, then um, you cannot find a small formula. But what if you find another set which uh, shows the opposite? Uh, uh, then what can you comment on? So in, in some sense, even if you find one set that is sufficient or... Uh, does she, uh, does this property need to hold for all possible sets? Oh, no, no. It, uh, so here's how you should think of it. If you were to just pick a random collection of linear maps, uh, uh, then this, uh, like if I pick a random collection of 10 linear maps, I take a point, hit it with a collection of 10 linear maps, uh, and the output uh, space has very large dimension, then these points will in the output space will all be linearly independent. So they'll span a 10 dimensional space. So the, the, the sort of the art here is in really finding linear maps where this dimension is small. Uh, and one collection of such linear maps will always suffice. Like in some sense, what this collection of linear maps is capturing is it's capturing the fact that this summand SI is low complexity. It's like, again, think of something like a power of a linear form or a power of a quadratic. It, it is very low complexity in, in the sense that it's very small number of, uh, or it has a small formula. Yeah, that is fine. But suppose for one set, you, you show these properties, right. but there exists another set in which the opposite properties hold, hold true. Is that possible or that's not possible? No, it, it is possible. In fact, if you were to just take random sets of linear maps, uh, both these quantities will be large. In fact, both these quantities will equal typically the number of linear maps. Um, okay. Yeah, Assuming the dimension of the output space is large enough, both these things will be almost always uh, the num- the number of linear maps. Okay. So in some sense, you're trying to find the worst case scenario or? Uh, yeah. Because if, if you take any random map, uh, any any random set, then you say this these yeah, will not hold. Have this property. So you're trying to find a specific set for yeah. these um, so that's kind of a worst case scenario, right? Which happens yes. only very rarely yes. in some and, sense. And Yeah, and it should happen for every SI which has a small formula. Okay, thanks. Thank you once again, sir, for an informative talk. And we have arranged some refreshments here. Please feel free to uh, continue discussions at the coffee hut. Thank you and have a nice evening.